because we are going to get um, a little bit of a jump on the new year here. My friends, my friends, entering by the door. How are you guys doing? Good. Matt, how are you doing? Yeah. I'm interested. Okay, let's just get in and see what happens. So, 1 Peter 2, 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be in. Holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And we emphasize that enough as you come to him, everything happens. We've been, we've been needing and has been following with me and going along in this journey of becoming house of God. And the truth is we haven't gotten into the practicals and nitty gritties. I've mostly just been like getting like the ideas out there for us. Well, today is actually a really exciting day because we get to start practicing some of it and seeing some of the pieces come together. And it starts with this idea of as you come to him. So here's, here's where we're going to go. Here's where we're going to go. This is a terrible picture of the temple. <laughs> Just it looks like it's ghastly. Okay? You know how many great I pictures mean. of Solomon's temple there are on the internet? But none of them show the wall around it. None of them. It's amazing. It's the, go on Google sometime. There's like no walls. of. They all just want to show the temple, which is great. But guess what? God put a wall around it. And there's reasons. Because there's doors when you have walls. Ah. Not all walls have doors. No, that's section. That's, that's, and so it's significant when they do. So where is this door? At the front. The door defines where front is in some ways. But where does it lead you to? First stop as you go through the door. The bronze altar. First stop as you enter into the house of God. You want to enter all the way into the presence of God. You want to come to Him. The first stop is the bronze altar, which speaks, which speaks of uh, the payment of sin, the burnt offering, the sin offering, which is the cross. It speaks of the cross. So this is going to be a very, I'm not going to be able to do everything today, so I'm going to have to layer in what we talk about with this, because we just can't, we just don't have enough of what we need to get it all done, either to process it all or to talk about it all in one day. So the idea from Hebrews, right, boldly approach the throne of grace. And on what basis can we boldly approach the throne of grace? The blood of Christ. He's the high priest. He's made the way. He's entered in by faith. We can boldly approach. Ephesians 3, we have access to God by faith. Um, actually, it says it again in Ephesians 2, we have access to God again by faith. So this idea that Peter brings out, as you come to him, what did Jesus say? Come to me, all you who are weak and weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Like, this is definitely God's call to every heart, right? Come to me. Just get, get to me. Get here. So what happens, though, with this temple imagery, the reason why it's so powerful, and the reason why it's everywhere in Scripture, and the reason why we're spending a lot of time studying it, is because it gives us a visual image of what it means to come to Him. What does it mean to come to Him? Because it's almost like a trap in some ways. God says, come to me through the cross. Come to me through the cross. <laughs> and wasn't that what happened to all of his followers? They came to him, and then he went to the cross. And that was the test of the followers. And then they kept coming to him after his resurrections. And what happened to them in their lives? <coughs> they all experienced the cross themselves. <laughs> Persecutions, the challenges, the loss of self. Coming to him, absolutely, need to, we want to, it's where all the blessing is. 
and, and we get there by going to the cross. And what it does, what it does is it gives us, uh, are you serious? No. It's supposed to be one at a time. We go to the temple so that we can become a temple. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. Hebrews talks about a temple in heaven, right? And we're going to be able to go and minister in that temple. It's a bit of a trick question. So in some senses, we ponder on the temple as being the place where God is. It's in heaven. But what does he call us? We're the temple. We are the temple. Individually, <coughs> meaning I myself, 1 Corinthians 6, you yourself are a temple for the Holy Spirit. But then the group as living stones, which is what he said here, right? As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men but the sight of God, you yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house. Okay? He says, come to him. So we're going to have to use temple imagery to understand how to come to him. But he says, you are temple too. Okay? So there's going to be something in there for us to grab out of the idea that we are temple. So in a sense, where this starts to take us is it starts to get us into the place where we start to understand more about God's dwelling in us. We've all heard that. That's very common. Does, does Christ live within us? Yeah, Ephesians 3. Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Do you think God's not going to dwell in a temple? Do you think the temple that he dwelt in in Solomon's day is going to be um, better and more uh, requirements on it? than the temple he lives in, in my heart. No, we're going to learn things from Solomon's temple that will teach us how to be a temple. Does that part make sense? I'm going to learn things about God's temple that he told Moses to build and told David and Solomon to build and that exists in the heavens. And those things are going to teach us how to be the temple. Are you with me on that? So it's going to become very educational, very informative, and very practical. Because I don't know about you guys, but I love coming to Him. But if I could understand more about what it means when I come to Him, what happens when I come to Him, what are the dynamics, why does sometimes I feel like I can't get to Him? You guys ever have that in your relationship with God? I just feel like I can't, whatever that is, get to Him. I know He's still good. I know He's still holy. I know He's still there. I know He still loves me. I just can't seem to, you know, bridge the gap, this kind of thing or any other challenge to the relationship with God in that way. This is going to give us, and I'm very excited to start us for it, the direction we need. We go to God's temple so that we can become the temple. Because we're temple too. So let's start here. How many doors should there be? How many doors should there be? One door. In my temple, how many doors should there be? that speak already? <laughs> and what should meet everything at the gate of our temple? The cross. The cross. If something is going to come inside me and I'm going to receive it, the first thing that it should interact with is the cross of Jesus Christ. Why does that become powerful? Someone tell me, why does that become powerful on its own? What about that passage? Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Everything that comes in gets funneled through the life of Christ. And what happens if that thing will not submit to the cross? It should not get in. <laughs> it should not. What happens though if we open up or allow other doors into our temple? The temple of our spirit. The temple of our inner life. What happens if we have other doors? Let's just talk it out. Let's be really simplistic. If you have a door coming in from the north, guess what? It doesn't have to go past the cross, does it? Have you ever heard that phrase? Have you ever heard that phrase, the foothold of Satan? Do not give a foothold uh, foot to Satan. 
This is the idea that he gets some sort of an entrance into our lives, that he has a leverage, a place that he's allowed to work. And so Paul warns us, don't give the devil a foothold. So can I use that idea of foothold and just give us the analogy of a door? Could I say then that Paul's saying, let's not have more doors into our temple? So right away, for us, when we think in terms of temple, I'm a temple, who's the house? If I'm going to guard the door, I'm going to start closing other doors into my life that allow other things, the entrance of other, name it, name it, ideas, spirits, thoughts, actions, because they become doors into the house of God. Who's the house? How then do I guard the door? Well, there's that passage again. Take every thought captive for the obedience of Christ. How do I guard the door? I'm going to have to start closing other doors, aren't I? <laughs> if I become aware of another door, how do I know if i got another door? Okay, okay. In Manitoba, we have a great phrase. Shut the door. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's start with cold air. When we say shut the door, we're saying don't let the cold air inside. Or flies. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Robbed me of my glory. <laughs> right. In the summertime, why do we tell our kids to shut the door? Flies and heat. Flies and heat. Flies. Okay. So how do you know when there's a door open? One, there's lots of no where are these flies coming from? Who left the door open? <laughs> or a window. Entrance points. Okay, you know that Satan's called the Lord of the Flies? <laughs> I just feel like that was a setup for this morning. <laughs> and if you've ever been trying to have a pray time with Jesus, there's a fly hitting your neck. <laughs> Satanic <laughs> fun. Okay. Okay, a little bit funnery, a little jokery, but isn't there truth in this? You know that you've got an open door when you find flies. When there's flies in your house, you need to find the origin. Something let them in. They didn't just grow. Something let them in. Cold air, something's letting it in. So that's the first step. We say, Holy Spirit, I'm pretty sure I've got some flies. But the first step, you could go, like, think about your actions. Think about your actions. If you just start swatting flies and don't close the door, how long are you going to swat flies? Forever. <laughs> Until they get to the tree. You know what the Bible calls this? Repentance. Repentance closes doors. Repentance closes doors. God, I've got an area that's open in my life. I've been allowing this or that or the other in, it's causing these changes in me, flies. It's changing the way it is inside of me, but it's happening because of this opening inside of me. So we start with repentance, which absolutely is the cross. <laughs> it's the place where we just say, God, I give it all up. I give it all over to you. So how do you find the opening? Look for the flies. There are going to be behavior. things, behaviors, attitudes, things coming out of me. Friday, I was a mess. I was trying to build Kyle's Christmas computer, and it was going terribly. And nothing makes me madder than tech problems that take forever. And yeah, cost more money. Funny. And I actually, by 5 o'clock, I said, sure. I, I got to go. And I seriously had to just go sit. And just be like, God, I've got, I'm, I didn't use open door in that sense, but that's what we're talking about here. I have let this stupid computer into my heart. <laughs> you know, it would have been fine if it just turned on right away, but it didn't. So, look, guess what? Irritation. Suddenly, everything my cute little three-year-old did was frustrating and annoying. And she's, oh, this was the best. I'm actually sitting, hovering over it, <laughs> telling you my sins. And she's crawling over my back and flopping over around my lap. I'm, I'm cross-legged on the floor in front of this thing. 
And I'm thinking, she's allowed to do it. She's my baby. I'm not going to let a computer get in the way of my butt. And her arm came by, and I almost bit it. <laughs> <laughs> that was when we said, okay. <laughs> that was enough. That was a pretty big fly. <laughs> But we just get, we get spinning, don't we? We get moving, we get doing, we get doing. Doing is probably our biggest enemy, isn't it? Because we're doing something, we don't have time to sit, so we offer a prayer. Because you can pray any time. You ever heard that lie? You can pray all the time. <laughs> yeah, tell that while you're fixing the computer while your baby's going over. And like, oh. No, what I really want is this computer to be fixed. I don't really want my heart straight. Therefore, I told myself I can pray at any time. Ah, look for the door. So we might spend some time. And you know what happened after supper? I hit a flipping button and it turned on. <laughs> I swear it was a miracle. I just, I don't even know what to say. I told Sherry, I think that was just God's gift to me after I humbled myself. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, how do we guard the door? How do we guard the door? Well, we've got identified flies. Gotta identify when stuff's buzzing around in our heads and our hearts that's not that doesn't belong. And then find out what's causing it. It was my just desire to get it done. Just desire to get it done. Okay? So so ultimately though, what do we actually allow in the house? This is huge. What should actually be allowed inside of our house? Yes. Remember that great verse from Paul that says, uh, therefore, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It's the only thing that's allowed in the house. It's the only thing allowed in this house. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Peace in the house when the flies are out. Peace in the house when the doors are closed. Peace in the house when repentance has done its work and the house is secure. Dan, you like a man who wants a secure house. Do you have a secure house? Something gets in, you're on it. You'd love an excuse to punch something once in a while, wouldn't you? <laughs> All right, well, whatever. What do you allow in the house, Dan? Only things you want. Okay. Only things that belong there. There's no cats. <laughs> so this is this is this is a really big deal, guys. Learning how to defend. <coughs> I am a temple. You are a temple of God. And and here's the trick: is uh, like we get God's Holy Spirit. We do. We get God's Holy Spirit, and He stays with us forever. So Amen. But there's this word called fullness. The fullness of his life. And when there's flies, and we're allowing flies, and there's open doors, and we're allowing open doors, what can God do with the fullness of his life? He's got to he, withhold it. He's a holy God. He's a holy God. So this experience of knowing God and being one with him and having a right relationship gets directly affected by these flies and these storms. And because of the cross, he gives us what we need to be able to defend the house. Therefore, Paul says, submit every thought captive to Christ. He gives us the tool that we need to have a house. But this is the nature of the cross. I need you to amen me after this. The cross is a willing instrument. You don't get dragged to the cross. God does not drag you to the cross and nail you up there. How did Jesus go to the cross? Like a lamb led to the slaughter, he let himself be crucified. So when we ourselves in salvation willingly come to God and submit to the cross of Jesus Christ, we get salvation. And the cross that guards our house, the one door that should be allowed there, we have to willingly desire to eject things out of our house. If we don't want to eject them out of the temple of our heart, then they stay. Because willingness is relationship. Willingness is the basis of love. Isn't that true? 
You can't make someone love you. They, when they willingly love you, it's love. So, what repentance does is repentance allows everything to be submitted to the cross of Christ, and then after it gets to the cross of Christ, it dies, doesn't it? Isn't that what the cross does? Doesn't the cross kill things? <laughs> okay. Maybe we never quite, we got to pick that up right now, okay? Maybe we've missed that more. When things get put on the cross, they die. When I got put on the cross with Christ, Galatians 2.20, what happened? I died. I died. So, how does things become alive again after they're dead? Can I do it? Can you do it? We don't have the power of life and death. So what we submit to the cross, it dies. But only God gets to decide what gets resurrected. Okay, what do I mean by that? Where's that going? Okay, we all live complicated lives. We all have complicated inputs. But when we start to have this concept of when I submit things to the cross, I'm killing them. Okay? I'm, I'm telling you all my sins today. Okay, you guys good with this? Okay, sure. All right. Okay, this will be a little awkward. I hope it doesn't make it weird on Sundays from now on. Okay. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not submitted with electric guitar. I'm not. I won't, I won't play it. I'm not very good. I'm not really not that good. But in my heart, I think I am. And I haven't broken it. I have not had that area fully submitted to Jesus Christ. It hasn't fully been killed. I'm going to tell you something. I'm pretty dead with the acoustic. <laughs> okay? I, I have a sense of peace. I can play music to Jesus on the acoustic, and it's been submitted to the cross, it's been killed, and it has been brought alive again, and it's safe now in the house of God. Does that make sense? Is this pride? It would relate to pride. It would relate to pride. Yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> So, 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 grabbing an electric, I don't have that sense of submission. I'm not using that tool really to honor God. It has not gone to the cross, it hasn't died, so I just stay with it. Until it gets killed, it may never, be, it, it's dead already, right? I don't touch it, that's good as dead. And then if I don't use it in worship, it's really dead, so it's kind of already dead. So this is what happens in our hearts, is God does want to use what we think of as our talents. We think of ourselves as people who can offer this or that or other. But can I use that as a good example of where to take this cross thing? God needs to submit, crucify, <laughs> take the earthy fleshiness out of our lives before they can be trusted. Does that make sense? There's an earthy, fleshy, human power, not really submitted thing in us, and it relates to how many places, how many things in our lives. And that's what the cross does. When something comes in, either it submits to the cross or it won't. So when electric guitar comes and it doesn't submit to the cross, it just doesn't come in. The acoustic guitar came in, and I have a, a story enough, a story and a half about it being crucified, where God and I sat down and we had kind of a crucifixion moment. <laughs> okay. And now, trust me, it can be in the house. It's safe. Can it go backwards? Just like everything else can go backwards. That's the nature of being in our human situation. Does God want to trust us? Yes! And not just with the gate, not just with the outer court, but where does God want to trust us? all the way in. Like, we are supposed to boldly enter in because of Jesus, and by faith, we die. By faith, we, we die in every area of our lives. And then He can trust us in every area of life, whether we get them back or not. What if God had killed off the guitars, and uh, that's it? Am I okay with that? Or do 
do I have a Christian right to play worship music to God on a guitar? Careful. See that? Isn't that sneaky? Isn't that sneaky? Because it's all about submission, willingness. The cross is the instrument of finding out what we really are willing to submit to God and trust Him with. Because if I had submitted it and it didn't get resurrected, do I trust God? No. Big stuff, eh? Important stuff. Very good stuff. We've got to get this house thing figured out. We're gonna we're gonna work on it in terms of us individually, but my friends, he called us a temple. These things are true for the us. All these things are true. The doors, the flies. I've got irritation between me and another relationship. Flies. The door has been opened. Okay, now, my friends, I have an announcement. Um, nothing feeds repentance like scripture. Can I get an amen? Nothing feeds repentance. Nothing, nothing expands my understanding of how to align with God like scripture. I need one more amen. Amen. Okay. Nothing prepares our souls like, like scripture. To be a house and to minister to the Lord. And nothing closes doors. To identify open doors. Uh, when, we, when we believe a wrong thing about our relationship with God, it's an open door. Scripture teaches us what's true. It closes doors. Uh, nothing reveals Jesus like Scripture. To enter all the way in, nothing reveals Jesus like Scripture. Nothing helps us come to Him like Scripture. So what we're going to do is, um, for three Fridays in January, um, I'll be here. This is going to be open as wide as people want to come. I'm going to invite the youth and others and whoever wants to come. We're going to spend three Fridays in January. And what we're going to do is basically we're going to sit down with Scripture. I've got a um, uh, plan sketched out, pencil style. We'll get it in ink as we go. On what, what are we going to do, what do you do? to get scripture to be more powerful in all of these ways. How and what, and what does the scripture say about itself uh, to give it um, its own voice? And then what do we do to get it inside of us? And some of these things are gonna be obvious and basic, but they'll just give us a chance to do them, to do them together, and to hopefully give us more tools with scripture. And then finally, nothing teaches us how to pray quite like the Bible that's filled with prayers. And so we're going to use it to learn how to pray to God, to pray for each other. Because, I don't know about you guys, but like when someone says, hey, I've been praying for you, I kind of get all melty inside. Like, really? You've been praying for me? It's cool. It is cool. If someone asks, how can I pray for you? We need to do that more. And so, if we've got more scriptures in our mind and in our heart, it'll feed this prayer. It'll teach us how to pray. Uh, so that'll be, I'm going to say seven. I know that doesn't work for everybody, but some people get home from work late. you got to do something, right? So... But if everyone can try to get there a little earlier than 7. It's not a, not a Sunday morning. So it be Friday night. We'll try for Friday night. If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. <laughs> so get, get started with this thing. Uh, I have another confession to make. Uh, uh, yeah, boy, Matt, wow. It's not even the new year. I know. Okay. Uh, but um, I promised this, you remember, at the end of the disciple class. Oh, yeah, I haven't forgotten it. It's only a year. <laughs> I haven't forgotten. Well, a year and a half. Okay, oh, I haven't forgotten it. <laughs> but I can't. How do I do this? You guys need to teach me how to learn to follow God and hear Him better. Okay, you can help me out with that. But 
I need God to kind of force it out of me. So like the disciple class, he forced it out of me. I couldn't not do it. Okay? It took this long because he kind of had to force it out of me. <laughs> but I think it's good timing. I think it's good timing for us. I think it's good timing for the new year. I think it's good timing for where we're at as a church family. What's the idea about doing it on a Friday instead of a Sunday? I don't know. You tell me. We can do it on a Sunday. I'm just throwing ideas around for well, timing. Well, it's available. Sorry, we didn't get to one of us. Anyway, um, it seemed good. I am really flexible on the day and time. I, that's all I got. Are you thinking about a Sunday morning or a Sunday night? Or what are you thinking? No, I was just wondering why, why not teach it on a Sunday morning. I was just asking what your thought was. Because we're going to take longer. And nobody likes to be in church longer than they have to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. That answers my question. <laughs> Ooh, I might scare some people away. <laughs> Seven to when, Matt. <laughs> Seven to when it's done. Uh, you know, we we need to we need to be chatty and we need to. I'm going to do some teaching, but then we're also going to practice it as we go, because certain parts are going to be like, you know, you're going to need to bring pen and paper and Bible, okay? And I'm going to have different printouts along the way to teach how to meditate and some of this kind of stuff. Um, Is there going to be like worship time too, or just... Yeah, but not necessarily involving music. music. It's... The, the nice thing about scripture is it tells you what to do, so it depends on mm-hmm. what we're doing. I'm actually really excited about this. I feel like I need to say that after asking questions. Okay. <laughs> like I really after expressing. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. I, uh, don't hold me over what happens afterwards. We're just going to see how that part goes, and I think it'll be pretty obvious what should happen. So, starting Friday, January 12th. Uh, that's basically two uh, two Fridays. Okay, now, to wrap us up for the day, this is, this is, okay, we've got the house, right? We've got our house, it's, uh, all the doors are closed, flies are ejected, um, we've gone to the cross. Uh, so what happens when the house is clear and the door is guarded, okay? Um, well, he said, he said, come to me, right? Well, guess what? When you come to him and your house is ready for him, then guess what? He comes. <laughs> There's no other way to describe it. There's no other Bible term to use it. He said, come to me, you came, and now you're with him. Now you're with him. So what does that now you're with him look like? You know that's the beauty part about having a relationship, is if it was the same thing every time, it would get boring eventually, wouldn't it? So who's in charge of your, who do you want in charge of your relationship with God? <laughs> who do you want to be in charge of your relationship with God? He's better at it. Yeah, I would like him to be the leader, please, in this relationship. But, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to ask a question. And it's, it's, it's going to be based on this verse, okay? Ephesians 3. I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints and what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay? Look at 15. He says, I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. If, if that doesn't fit inside of him coming into us, living in us, I don't know what does. It's going to live inside us. And when he does, he comes with love. He comes with love. I recognize that the subject of God's love gets beat up, either from people who use it too much, people who use it too little, 
uh, a culture that would rather have God's love replace his justice and these kinds of things. I get that. And so for some reasons like that, I've avoided making the love theme of God too big of a deal. But right now, my friends, we're turning a corner. And here's what we have to understand. The dimensions of the love of Christ in me is the dimensions of the fullness of God in me. Do you see that? The dimensions of the love of Christ in me is the dimensions of the fullness of God in me. If I want more fullness of God, the more fullness of God comes to the size and length and width and depth of the love of Christ. When we become that house and we ready the house, we close the doors, we clear it out, we consecrate it, God, this space is yours. You know what? Among the first things that we should experience, dare I say experience? <laughs> is love. It's love. It's love. So I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to ask a question. How long can you sit with Jesus and just let him love you? How long can you sit with Jesus and just let him go? I pray that being rooted and grounded in what? That you may have strength to comprehend of all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness. All the fullness. If Christ is dwelling in my heart, I should be having a dimension, that is to say, expanding, growing, understanding, which would mean experience of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Okay, what do I mean by that? What am I implying by that? What am I leaving this story now? Here's what I'm saying. We have, we're starting starting right now. 2018 starts tomorrow. We're getting an early jump, okay? You're going to hear this from Matt a lot. How long can you sit with Jesus and just let him love you? I recognize that if you start saying things like that and turning it into a religious exercise and who's sitting with Jesus letting him love you, that you can create dangerous things. I get that. But where else do we want to go with this thing than into the fullness of God that is in the love of Christ? And if we allow our Christianity to be defined by the things that we do rather than receiving the love of Christ, we're going to create a wrong religious experience for our children to follow. Not cool. Not cool. Christianity is not the stuff you do. Someone give me an amen. So then what is it? It's going to be rooted and grounded in love. It's going to be rooted and grounded in love, and it's going to have the dimensions, the length, the width, the height, and the depth of the knowledge of the love of Christ, which means we are going to have to do something, which is sit and let Jesus love us. Kind of sounds refreshing, though, doesn't it? <laughs> this is what God wants to give us. How do we give love? We got to get it. Remember doing First John for a couple of months. We got to receive love from God to be able to give it. We're coming back to that subject right now with this. If we're going to be the house of God, it's going to be filled with love. If we're going to reach the town for Jesus Christ, it's because we're going to be filled. So, here's a question. <clears throat> what season are you in? If you want to close your eyes and ponder this, you can, or if you can do it with your eyes open. Just, you can kind of ask God this question. What season am I in? <laughs> we've been talking about doors open. We've been talking about flies. We've been talking about receiving love from Jesus. Talking about scriptures. You know, 
that's the question. What, what season are you in? Is this a door closed or open season? Is there a lot of flies? Is there needing to be scriptures? Are you doing good with scriptures now? Are you receiving love? You know, what's the state of your house? You know, maybe ask the Holy Spirit that. You know, do I have doors that are open? Do I have doors that are open? What are the flies? That would be another good question to ask the Holy Spirit. What are the flies? What flies are disturbing my ability to sit with you? What about what about as a group? What's the state of our house of God as a group? We are one house of God. What are the doors that are open in our house? What are the flies that are flying around our house? And then the fullness of God. How are we doing on experiencing the fullness of God? I'm telling you right now, I'm excited to move in that direction. Uh, I tend to be more of the fight battles kind of uh, Christian, and there's a huge need for that. But you know what sustains your ability to fight battles? The love of Christ. <laughs> it comes first. Guys, we are going to have to move into some battles, but if we don't know how to receive love from God, we're not going to be able to finish it. It's time to receive love, my friends. So let's just play, close our eyes and pray a little bit. I'm going to give us some directions, okay? What I want you to do, if you're willing to do this with me, on the question of how long can you sit with Jesus and just let him love you. So if you've got your eyes closed, you know what, just kind of see yourself as a house. I don't know how you want to do that, but see yourself as a house. And, uh, you know, the truth is, we can have doors open, we can have flies buzzing around, and God's love can still penetrate into us. How do you think he saves sinners? So, right now, are you willing to let Jesus just love you? Or is there, is there any unwillingnesses kind of uh, resisting? If I said, just let Jesus love you, do you have anything that pushes back against that? Or can you just let Jesus love you? Because he's not looking for good works, performance. He's not looking for our own righteousness. He's looking for faith. Can I just let him know? Do I have any uh, do I have anything in me that says it's a waste of time to just let Jesus love me? As though my schedule is so important that I can't pause and just let Jesus love me. Do I question if Jesus loves me? I'm not worthy of love after things that I've done, things that I've failed in, things that I've uh, allowed in, the flies, the doors. Why would he love me? i got to get perfect before he can love me. Well, that's what we're doing right now. We're not going to go there. We're going to let Jesus love us even with our flies. And let the light of Christ start to push out some flies too. Let the light of Jesus Christ close some doors too. Sometimes those open doors are giving us love that we need. But if we're filled with love, we don't need that door anymore. Can we just let Jesus love us right now? Right here, right now. Without any preparation. Yeah, God, there's still a lot of flies, and that's fine. It's fine for now. Maybe look at your flies and say your end is coming.
Because it's true, once we close the doors and get the flies out, that experience of receiving love from Jesus magnifies and multiplies to fullness. So Lord, the little taste that we have of just your appreciation and valuing of us, your love toward us, has given us just that starting taste that will lead us back to the simple place of receiving love from you. And then we'll have that question in front of us again. How long can I sit and just receive love from you? A moment or two here and there is good. A few minutes a day is good. How long can we sit and just let Jesus love us? Or do we have to be doing something all the time? Let's start there. God, we repent of having to do something all the time. Let me just say that if you, if you will. God, we repent of having to do something all the time. That thing must be taken to the cross and killed in me. That I have to do something all the time. As if somehow sitting and letting Jesus love us is not a worthy activity. You call that a lie, Lord. Would you kill that lie? I know, I know us in here do spend time with you, Lord. I know that. But we're building, we're growing, we're expanding. And we're going to get the root lies out and not assume that they're gone. You are worthy of us sitting and let, letting you know. So God, I ask for more help from heaven for our church and for us after this kind of a message. This is a very important message, actually. It's a very important subject that we can spend time on today. Very important. And so it's uh, a threat to the enemy. So Lord, we ask that you oppose the enemy in our hearts and our houses, in our families and in our relationships, our spouse relationships, and here in the church that you would defend each one of these relationships among us so that we can have um, the fullness of God established among us as a church, as a house, with uh, all the doors closed but one, all the flies out, and just the fullness of God. So God, thank you for leading us this morning. Thank you for your words on this matter. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Have a good New Year.